I'm Adam Hahn, co-founder and CTO of Judicata. We're mapping the legal genome to help you better understand the law. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Adam Hahn, and this is Judicata's Startup Engineering MOOC Lecture. Now, before I begin, I want to give a little disclaimer. Judicata is definitely the earliest of all of the startups that you're hearing in your lectures. We're about 14 months old, and we're in the legal technology space. We're seven people, five engineers, and we're still learning, just like every other company. But just a little disclaimer, we haven't figured everything out, and that's okay. We're telling you what we know. We still think it's gonna be useful for us to talk because in the event you do, start your own company, we should be the company that you are able to relate to the most because we're the earliest. And with that, we'll begin. So, Judicata, what are we doing? Our tagline is mapping the legal genome. That means turning unstructured court opinions into structured data. We do this using highly specialized case law parsing code combined with algorithmically assisted human review. Now, the end result of all of this is a product that is used by lawyers. Usually, you know, a segment that people love to hate. Well, for us, they're our core customers. Um, we're not a consumer company. We're not even, we can't even really be called an enterprise company because we only sell to one specific type of enterprise, and that's gonna be lawyers. But what we do do is help lawyers make sense of all of this dis normally disaggregated information. Uh, right now we're parsing millions and millions of sentences, 21 million, and 77 million component attributes. So a little bit about me. I graduated from Stanford in CS in uh, 2008. I'm not a lawyer. I considered going to law school, but I uh, met my co-founder and now our CTO, or sorry, CEO, Itai, and uh, he wisely told me not to go. Um, and it's great because I've been able to apply my CS background as, and as well as my interest in, very strong interest in law and, uh, you know, they mesh perfectly. So I'm the co-founder and CTO. I've been involved in uh, pretty much every decision having to do on, with the technical side of stuff. So uh, the initial decisions to be pre-commit code review and continuously deploying stuff from the beginning, as well as all the decisions about how to represent our legal genome, this data. Now, before I get into, you know, what our engineering stack is and everything like that, I want to make sure that we all have a kind of a common vocabulary and kind of explain what are the problems that we're solving. Because it's not intuitive like, you know, some of these other companies that you might have heard. In 1969, there was a case called Schimmel. So what happened in Schimmel was this guy Schimmel gets arrested. And he gets arrested in his own house. The police come, they have a warrant for his arrest, and they take him in. But they say, uh, because of officer safety, because it's it's necessary for police officers to be safe, we, we, we searched his house. We, we had to, you know, uh, we had to do it. In the, in the process of searching his house, they find stuff that they use to convict him. And Schimmel says, hey, you, you can't do that. You actually, uh, need a warrant to search for stuff normally. Now, they had a warrant for his arrest, but not to search his house. So, uh, the Supreme Court actually said, look, you can't say you can search the entire house as part of officer safety, uh, but we will let you search um, on sh their person and kind of Im immediately around them for, for officer safety. So the search was invalid because they didn't have a warrant and Shimmel got to go free. Then, about 12 years later, New York v. Belton comes down. Now in this case, it was slightly different. So in Belton, this guy is driving in New York. He gets pulled over. Officer smells some marijuana, looks and sees something that looks like marijuana, and they arrest him for it. Now, because of search incident to arrest, like the, the principle that, that was uh, talked about in Schimmel, 
um, he the police officer searches the car for um, officer safety and and finds some cocaine. Now uh, Belton says, "Hey, you you can't do that," um, and it goes up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, "Look, we know this is really hard for police officers to to operate with a shimmel standard in, in in cars. Like, what does it mean for cars? So we're new rule. We're revising it." Uh, in cars, if you arrest someone, you get to search the entire interior cabin of the car. So it's not just kind of the, the immediate area around them, it's the whole interior cabin. From then on, that was the law of the land. The day after that opinion, it changed the law. All right, so now Belton is the law of the land. And... Uh, it takes a long time, but the, all these lower courts are disagreeing about how Belton works. Um, and finally, the Supreme Court takes up a case in 2009 um, called Arizona v. Gantt. So in Gantt, uh, basically this guy Rodney Gantt was suspected of doing some drug stuff. So they had some police officers staked out. Um, and when he gets out of his car... They arrest him for driving with a suspended license. Now, they arrest him, they put him, handcuff him, and put him in the back of the squad car. Then, because Belton made such a clear rule, it said, they said, all right, we're going we're gonna to search the car. Belton said, if we arrest someone, we can search them. We can search their car. Um, and they find some cocaine. And uh, the one good thing to learn is that all these... Uh, search cases. All the good ones have to do with drugs. Uh, they find some. They find some drugs. Um, charge them with 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 that stuff. And Gant says, "No, you can't do that. I. I you, this is all about officer safety, and yet I'm detained in the back of a squad car, and handcuffed. There's no way I could have like lunged for a weapon or anything in that car." Um, and the court agreed. Uh, the court said that uh, the the laws changed. Belton is no longer a bright line rule. You say you can only search if uh, you know you if they're still in the car and you think they might be able to get to a weapon or destroy some piece of evidence, or um, you think that you're going to find some evidence that has something to do with the reason you arrested them. Um, so this was a huge change in uh, in the law. And again, in 2009, you probably didn't know it, but your rights changed overnight. Um, and and you know. Law enforcement has to react to this immediately, but more important than, well, not more important than us, but uh, equally important are uh, the lawyers who argue things in front of this court. They have to keep up with these rules too. And it's not just, you know, fun constitutional stuff, if you consider this fun, I do. Uh, fun constitutional stuff like like this, but any, uh, there's, the Supreme Court hears, you know, a bunch of cases every year, and it's not just the Supreme Court that's setting precedent, it's all the court appeals, it's all the state Supreme Courts. It's all, you know, the, the state intermediate appellate courts. They all set uh, precedent as well. So it's critically important for a lawyer when you're arguing in front of a judge to know what the rules are. Legal writing is very formulaic. And whenever you say, uh, we think this should happen, you give a citation to a case explaining why you think the court should rule that way. So let's take a look at Arizona v. Uh, we, we find that, uh, this is a, a page from, from the opinion, we find that uh, it's, it's even more beyond these three cases. It's, you know, Marin v. United States, and then uh, it's changed in Gobart v. United States, and then a year later changed again. You know, it's this stream of changes. And what uh, could be frustrating to you is that these, these changes in this, law what governs us is not written out like a computer program it's not you know bullet points it's prose like this um and it's it you have to figure out what's going on so what we do is this is a this is a california case um no longer supreme court stuff um but this is a case and if we take a look at it we have we have the same it's the same type of language across the court. You know, you, you say, you know, this is what happened. We're discussing some cases and then I'm going to give a citation to something else. Um, 
So our you know, highly specialized case law parsing code can take this, and um, this is a visualization that we have in, internally uh, to see what's going on in here. And you can tell based on this, you know, the brown things are references, the red things are, you know, things where we we know like affirmed is a, a verb that we want to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, the yellow C down there at the bottom, that's uh, a signal word, which has a very specific legal meaning. So this is kind of the output. And if we blur our eyes a little bit, um, then we're left with just data. Data that we can reason about because we know what's going on at every level. So that's a little bit of common law. Uh, this is uh, you know, a news article announcing our funding. Peter Thiel is one of our investors, um, along with a handful of other uh, angels. Um, my co-founder, Blake, um, it has reached a little bit of internet fame by taking the CS183 notes. Um, and uh, he is a co-founder. He graduated from Stanford Law School um, last year. So let's dive into engineering culture at Judica a little bit. Um, our dev tools are pretty similar to what you would find at you know, most other startups. Uh, everyone can get a Mac, really anything you know, Unix-y, but uh, you know, we, we, we like the Macs. Uh, uh, I assume you're familiar with Brew stuff. Um, this is just a shout out to some of my favorite tools. Um, I like iTerm a lot. Tmux is a little bit more pure, but iTerm, I like the splitting in it. Um, we don't really have uh, specific editors that we mandate. However, I am very partial to Vim. In terms of uh, front-end debugging and stuff, um, I love Chrome. Command option J is crucial. The dev tools, please um, learn about them to le just learn what is possible. It's amazing how much is it has advanced from you know the days of uh, just Firebug. Um, they have some great videos on uh, YouTube, the Google developers, as well as good documentation on their website. And uh, like most other startups, we use New Relic. Um, it's uh, a really valuable tool for figuring out just what's going on. Basically effortless uh, debugging of some stuff. So this is a view uh, inside the office. You see we have some uh, standing desks, also uh, not shown in this, there's some sitting desks. Um, and uh, one thing that we like is, this is the, the, the coolest Reddit that you've never heard of because it's private, uh, our judicata. Um, we use it for, you know, because we're in this kind of domain specific space, we trade links about you know, legal stuff um, or you know, technology stuff and things like that, but it's a place for us to just you know, have private conversations. And uh, we uh, really like it a lot. Nice place to go um, have asynchronous conversations when you know, uh, something you have is indexing or compiling or what have you. Um, this is a little inside baseball, but you know, we get our lunch catered to us. We really like caviar. Uh, trycaviar.com um, for delivering all of our stuff to us. Oh yeah, and this is from our um, holiday party. <laughs> our uh, CEO, Itai, uh, is into home brewing stuff, so uh, one of our engineers made him brew judicata. I want to transition now to talking about frameworks. So if you can't tell, the most important thing is to be skeptical of a new framework. When someone on your team approaches you and says, hey, I got this cool new framework I wanna integrate into our project. Your reaction shouldn't be, oh, cool, a new framework, yeah. It should be, a new framework? Why? A new dependency? Do we need that? And that's exactly the, 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 first, the first question I ask myself whenever I am considering adding an external dependency. Do we really need this in our code? How many lines of code is it gonna save us? Is it just 10 lines of code and I'm feeling a little lazy? Maybe I should just buck up and implement it. Now, um, most of the time, there is a legitimate reason to use it, but sometimes there isn't. So if there is, the next heuristic I use is to read the documentation. Now you can learn a lot about a project by reading its documentation. Um, a well-documented project is going to help you reason about how this new dependency is going to interact with you. Uh, one great example of this is Redis. If you go to redis.io slash commands, 
um, they actually go a step further and tell you about the big O runtime of every command. That's really great in terms of figuring out if I put this H keys call here, how is that going to affect the runtime of this outer function? Another well-documented project is uh, Django. Um, I, I feel like they do a good job of telling you in good detail what every method's going to do and the potential pitfalls. Now, if you're still on the fence, the next thing to do is to read the source code. Now, I don't mean digest all of it, but these are open source projects most of the time. Um, we can just open it up and take a look. If, if there were a problem with this, would you be able to, uh, would you be comfortable looking at a stack trace inside this project? It's a good question to ask yourself. And finally, taking a look at the community. Maybe everything looks good, but then you realize there's only five questions on Stack Overflow about this project ever. Perhaps it's not the right idea to put into your production environment. Just saying. So now that we've talked about how frameworks are evil, let me tell you about all the frameworks that we use. Um, so it kind of goes without saying we're on AWS. And on the back end, we are um, a Django shop. We use South for migrations. Um, Tasty Pie uh, is Django Tasty Pie is great for um, really quickly making an API for you. And what's nice about that is that it's not tightly coupled to the ORM. That means if something needs to change, or if you change the name of a model, you don't necessarily have to change the name of the API endpoint for backward compatibility reasons. It's also cool in that it only exposes primitive values over the API and makes you deal with foreign key relationships, which I think is a good thing for an API because everything in your database is going to be related to each other in some way. And if you try to have too much magic going on, you'll probably get bitten. It's also very easy to override uh, the default behavior in it. Uh, we use DSE for bulk operations and NetworkX for some graph analysis, analysis stuff. Um, now, in terms of the data representation, we start out with um, Postgres plus Redis. Uh, Postgres is really nice. If you compare the Postgres documentation versus the MySQL documentation, you'll see my uh, heuristic number two uh, and kind of figure out why we're running Postgres. Um, it's a lot more predictable in terms of its performance. Now, we started with Redis as well for storing um, key value attributes of some of our uh, components that we parse out. But what's kind of interesting about us is that even though we are pre-revenue and you know we're not selling our product to anyone, the reason we aren't selling it is because the thing that we're working on right now is this legal genome, making all of this data. So it's kind of interesting in that we have scaling issues before we've sold to customers. So as we started parsing um, you know, more than you know, hundreds of thousands of cases, we figured out oh, wow, Redis is not going to work for us because it's trying to keep everything in RAM. So we end up migrating to just Postgres. Postgres is flexible enough that we were able to just make a uh, key value table inside of Postgres. And actually, we look forward to using the Postgres hstore functionality, which is kind of like Redis key value-like operations natively supported in Postgres. And it's just a column in your table. Postgres is pretty flexible. Um, and we use Solar for searching stuff. Nothing fancy. It's not an external, a third-party search provider. It's just Solar. It's good enough for Instagram. It's probably good enough for us. Now, on the front end, uh, we use Django for base template stuff and some complex HTML for rendering some, some uh, tree representations of cases and things like that. It's too much rendering to put on the client side. But in general, we use uh, client-side rendering to make our application feel snappier. To keep our JavaScript modular, we use Require.js, which is uh, really good at enforcing, creating somewhat reusable components at the very least. We use Backbone, and along that we use two Backbone extensions, Backbone Relational and Backbone TastyPy. TastyPy inter interfaces with the TastyPy API, like I discussed earlier, and Relational makes it so that you can access foreign keys uh, through Backbone uh, very easily without having to wire that up yourself. Finally, we use less for our CSS generation, and that's mostly because we decided to use Bootstrap, and Bootstrap uses less, Twitter Bootstrap. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about how work gets done at Judicata. So we have something called the clerk, and it's based on the Supreme Court clerk, or basically any other clerk, court clerk. The clerk is so important that it is designated in Rule 1-1 of the Supreme Court rules. It says, the clerk receives documents for filing with the court and has authority to reject any submitted filing that does not comply with those rules. That sounds a lot like continuous integration, to me at least. And later, Rule 41 says, opinions of the court will be released by the clerk immediately upon their announcement from the bench. That sounds a lot like continuous deployment. So clerk was the perfect name for our little test and deploy bot. This is a screenshot of our code review system. And the first thing you'll notice is that it is not GitHub. It is in fact Garrett. Garrett is an open source project um, used most famously by Android in their code review. Um, so it's written by Googlers, it's, it's good. We actually, when we started the company, um, I started with me and my co-founder, uh, Itai, we were two engineers and we used Garrett because I wanted us to do code review from the beginning. And it just, it was, it worked well. And then we, and then we hired, um, you know, three other engineers and I said, okay, let's get serious. Let's move to GitHub. And, you know, the GitHub flow works really well for open source projects, I think, but I don't think it's ideal for organizations. Uh, who are developing proprietary code, or, or at least our organization didn't feel that way. So we decided to move back to Garrett, and we like it because of, uh, it has a, f for a few reasons. Well, one, on GitHub, the idea is you, um, if you want to do pre-commit code review there, you push to your branch, and then you say, hey, please review this by tagging them in it. And then they give you a plus one or something like that, or you know, they write it in a comment. It's not explicit, but they write in a comment that says, hey, looks good to me. And uh, then you're supposed to merge it in. But if it doesn't look good to them and they have requests for you to fix something, then it can get kind of hairy because then you have to push back to that branch uh, a new commit that says, you know, changes in response to code review or something, whatever. And you might have two or three of these. And then all of a sudden you have th four commits, only one of which was the actually interesting one, then three other commits that are just used to, you know, fix things. Um, and it kind of messes with your Git log. Um, it can make your Git log mean um, not every revision was deployed. And uh, it can also mean that you can't, some of the revisions plain old might not work. Um, the way that Garrett works, whereas GitHub is very open with how you can use your, your, your flow, Garrett is much more constrained and says, okay, this is how the flow is gonna work, which I think is something that has to be said in, in an organization anyway. It says, this is the flow. Um, you push to this magical branch, Garrett does some magic, and then uh, you, Garrett keeps track of the differences between the patch sets. Um, so it's very easy to see, you know, okay, this was, he, he responded to my changes here and we left comments there. Um, it makes the act of code review a lot easier. So now I want to show you how the clerk interacts with the rest of our admittedly pretty small infrastructure. Let's start with the right side of the diagram. So you'll see that clerk has an SSH connection open with Garrett. Garrett is actually pretty cool in that respect that it has an SSH interface um, to receive events about what's going on in the repository. So when a change set is updated or added for the first time, clerk gets that notification and then tars up the project and sends it over to a server called Lemon, uh, which is a, a test bot call it lemon because there's a famous, there's a lemon test where uh, it, it kind of outlined what is the rule for excessive government entanglement in religion, um, state-sponsored religion. So it, basically my job at the company is to come up with crazy names for services and servers and then have all the engineers ask me why. Um, so that's how testing works, it's very simple. But what's interesting is we use a different interface for deployment, which is the left side of the diagram. 
you'll see multiple lines for uh, clerk and Garrett. That mean that's because once every minute it pulls Garrett and just says, "Hey, um, what's the latest revision you have? What's the latest revision you have for this project?" It clerk keeps track of what is the latest revision deployed, and then Garrett will let it know if there's a new head. The reason we use this. Um, admittedly more dumb interface for deployment is because deployment is critical to us. If we can't deploy, clerk is how we deploy everything. We can live without testing, you know, for a day or something like that, but we want to make sure that the interface for deployment is bulletproof. Uh, with SSH, something weird could break or something like that. Polling is so dumb, we can't really mess it up. We'll never say never, but um, we haven't messed it up yet. Um, so it, it pulls once a minute and see if if there's an, a, a new uh, SHA-1 out there. And if there is, it tars it up and sends it to the, the appropriate server. Um, uh, you see we have different servers go going on. Um, our, our Django uh, web app, our parser, um, which is written in Java, and then our solar instance, um, which is... Uh, it, its own standalone server. And I highlighted the Marbury and Parser in uh, orange because those are stateless. Um, the nice thing about statelessness is that, well, right now we're just running them on standalone EC2 instances. We plan on changing them to uh, using Amazon Elastic Beanstalk so that we get scaling for free. Um, just one of the nice things you get when you design a web application correctly. So this would be the part of the talk when I mention our API and all the cool stuff you can do with it. Well, as you might expect, because we are pre-revenue and uh, haven't uh, released anything yet, we don't exactly have an external API yet. However, we do have stuff for you to play with, um, and it's actually pretty interesting. Of course, I'm biased to say that, but I still think it's pretty cool. Our data set is um, 15,000 recent California cases that are parsed with references. So these are cases from 2011 and 2010, um, both criminal and civil cases. And I'll show you what the XML looks like. There's a whole DTD in the README and the README explains more about what's going on specifically. But you see we have some metadata, when it was filed, what court it was in. Um, this court is USCA SCT, so Supreme Court. Um, all of these are gonna be California cases. But um, you see we've parsed out sentences for you, paragraphs, it's all nicely nested. As we keep going, um, you see some cool stuff here, um, these reference nodes. And what's interesting is that these are three references and they all have the same href, yet the text inside of them is different. Uh, this is equivalent to a hyperlink in judicial writing. Um, except that uh, normally they don't declare the href as cleanly as we have. We've reconciled them for you so that you know uh, that this first reference to steal, the second and the third one are all talking about the exact same case. What's interesting is that you probably won't have this case. It says in Ray Steel 2004. That's going to be before this time of this data set. Yet, you still know information about this case. What information do you know about this case? Well, you can look at the sentence that it was referenced in and the sentence prior to it. The way legal writing generally works is you say the rule is X, period, and you see C case, you know, Rho v. Doe. And Rho v. Doe is stating the proposition that the prior sentence was talking about. So what can we do with this data set? Well, one thing is you have a bunch of parsed language. You can look at, okay, what are some interesting n-grams across these cases? How did the n-grams change for, you know, say civil cases versus criminal cases? I'll give you a hint. You can tell a criminal case because it's always people v so-and-so. And civil cases are always, you know, party A versus party B. You know, not not the state suing you. Uh, you can also look at a citation graph. Because we have the hrefs parsed out for you, um, you can treat those as edges and nodes as cases. 
You can do some very interesting visualizations with this citation graph. What is cited the most and, and why? What, why? Why is this uh, case such a, a hotbed? Um, what can you tell about the cases you don't have? And finally, you know, bonus points, can you detect any judicial bias? So now I want to transition to talking about my path to judicata. I didn't start this company when I was in college. It actually started, you know, three and a half years after college. But what I did do in college was I nurtured my interest in law. And it's this interest that I sustained that got me to where I am. Most people think what we do is incredibly unsexy. I think it's great. I'm a little bit weird, I guess, but by having this very strong interest in computer science and this very mature interest in law, put me in the perfect position to start this company. Now, I know a lot of other people want to start something immediately out of school or not even finish school or whatever, and they might be pressured into doing that simply because that's what you do. I don't think I can condone that. A startup is something that lasts five, six years. I don't think you want to bring it upon yourself to be doing something that long that you're just not interested in. Another thing that I've learned is you have to embrace your differences. We are, a, Judy Guy is a pretty different startup. You know, we have this backlog of cases that we have to process. We have a lot of work to do. We do something that's very on Silicon Valley, um, but it's because we're taking a big swing at something. The incumbents in this in industry were incorporated in 1870s and the 1970s. It's hard. We're taking a very big swing at something. We're not doing the low-hanging fruit. If it were easy, it would have been done already. It's important to realize that you don't have to be like every other company in Silicon Valley. So in sum, don't be afraid to be different. You don't have to be like everyone else. Don't be afraid to go deep. You should approach your frameworks and new tools skeptically. And finally, of course, the best code is less code. Code that you don't have to write, you don't have to maintain. Here's some resources that uh, I would like to share one if you're at all interested in law or you know you even if you're not i highly encourage you to read a jailhouse lawyer's manual or at least the very beginning of it what's interesting about it is it's a publication made by columbia law school and it's for people who are in jail prisoners who are trying to get out of jail legally and so it begins with a layman's introduction to the u.s legal system and it's actually a very good description um not to compare you to prisoners in terms of intellect, but I'm saying it's a good, it's a good introduction, um, as well as the f basics of legal research and kind of the, the problems of getting out of prison legally. Uh, the second link is the Oye Project. That contains a corpus of Supreme Court oral arguments. Um, this really fed my interest when I was uh, trying to learn about the law, and it was a great way to really immerse myself. In terms of engineering blogs I like, there's a million, but two that particularly resonate and helped me uh, with Judica were uh, Instagram engineering blog. Um, they also take a very, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, keep it very simple approach, um, as well as the build.com, which is great more specifically for people who are doing the Django Postgres route. So uh, thank you for watching and here's my contact information. All right, well, I hope you were able to learn something from our small companies talk. Maybe you are excited to play with this novel data set uh, or you learned that it's not the worst thing to do something different or hard, but at the very least, I hope you took away the fact that you should keep your frameworks to a minimum and make all your external dependencies easy to reason about. All right. Thanks for watching. I'm Adam from Judicata. Goodbye.